geologist. I specialize in groundwater. My role in eastern Montana is to, to uh, manage and, and keep running the groundwater monitoring around coal and coal bed methane. So we look at quantity and quality issues associated with coal development. So because I'm a hydrogeologist, I'm going to start with this slide, which is to point out that coal is an aquifer. And it's an important aquifer in Montana. It's laterally extensive throughout much of south, southeastern Montana. And it's, it's reasonably transmissive. So it makes for a good source of stock and domestic water for most of the residents in southeastern Montana. And here is a picture of an outcropping of the canyon coal as it's being developed for a livestock um, water. However, coal is also an energy resource, and of course that's what most people think of when they think of coal, especially in Montana. It's developed um, it throughout southeastern Montana. More recently, coal has been developed for its uh, naturally occurring methane. This is a picture of one of our water well monitoring wells, which produces um, a constant supply of methane. And so this is a picture of it at night. Um, after it's been lit, and then it be shut in it for it later. Um, but so, so it's, when I say more recently, that's within the last 20 years or so, it's become an economic um, driver. So it's been economically produced since about 1999 in Montana. Coal in Montana, it's, it's pretty extensive throughout Montana. The grade of the coal increases as you go to the west. So the pink is the bituminous coal, the higher grade coal. Yellow is subbituminous, and then the lignite is prevalent throughout eastern Montana. However, while it's present in most counties, um, not which does not include Silverboat, which is where we are right now, I am stationed here in Yellowstone County in Billings, and most of the resource and almost all of the development in Montana is in the Powder River Basin. And again, this is a subbituminous coal play. Uh, the demonstrated reserve base in Montana is 120 billion tons. That represents over one-fourth of the entire reserve base of the United States and about 8% of the world's reserve base. So we are, we are rich in coal in this state. 70 of those tons, 70 billion tons, are underground and 50 are accessible through surface means. And again, of, of what is developed, 90% of it comes from the Powder River Basin. To give you an idea of the geology of what we're talking about in the Powder River Basin, this is an east to west cross section across the basin. The coal mines are developed here along the Tongue River. Each of these colored bars represents a distinct named coal. You can see there's quite a bit of faulting that complicates the geology and complicates the hydrogeology. When you're producing coal bed methane, this has to be taken into account. Um, the coal mines all occur near outcrop. Coal bed methane occurs in the central part of the basin where the coals are deep enough to maintain the methane in place. When you get too shallow, the methane naturally escapes. Water wells are developed throughout the basin, mostly in the shallower coals. Where the coal outcrops at the surface, that's usually a source of springs, and so those are also important water sources, generally developed for stock use. Another look at the geology, just to give you an idea of the number of coal seams that we're talking about in Montana, we have um, a number of, of mapped and named coals. Uh, this is the Fort Union Formation. So the Tongue River member of the Fort Union Formation, it's a tertiary formation. It's, these coals are being developed, almost all of them are developed either in Montana or Wyoming for coal bed methane, meaning they're being produced for methane. These bars, or these, these trapezoids, represent where we monitor the groundwater. So we have monitoring wells in those same zones. We're monitoring quantity and quality issues. To jump into the coal 
story in Montana. This is a picture of the um, Sarpy Creek coal mine. The, the coal mines, the one that I just showed you, um, this is the Absaloka, it's also known as Sarpy Creek because it's along Sarpy Creek. All the, these four are surface mines. They're in the Powder River Basin. That's where 90% of the development is. There's a little mine out here in the east. Signal Peak is our only subsurface mine, and it's just north of Billings. Montana currently produces around 40 to 45 million tons of coal per year. You can see that has been the case. It's produced in this 40 million ton range um, since the mid 80s, so it's been fairly consistent for 20 to almost 30 years now, producing at about the same rate. Um, early time Montana coal, this is 1924 on this axis, this is 2015, 2014 on this axis, on this end. Early time coal development was all for transportation. It was all used in the railroads, locomotives. So when the diesel locomotives were introduced in the late 50s, um, Montana coal fell off to almost non-existent. However, in the late 60s, early 70s, the introduction of the Clean Air Act, which is addressing uh, particulates and, and acid rain issues, because Montana coal is low sulfur, it became a much more popular choice for energy uh, production. It's a low, it's, it's subituminous, and so it has a lower BTU per ton uh, ratio than the bituminous coal that is prevalent throughout eastern, the eastern U.S., but because it's a low sulfur and therefore cleaner coal in that sense, um, it became a much more popular source of coal for, for energy production. The coal in Montana, about one-fourth of it is used in Montana, and that's primarily for energy production. It's burned in power plants. About half of it is shipped to the Midwest, um, states like Illinois, Indiana, where they also burn it for, for energy production. About 15% of it is exported through Canadian ports to um, primarily Asian countries. Montana's use is almost all for energy production. It's burned in power plants. And Montana is a net exporter of energy, so we create more energy than we use within the state by about half. And so about half of this energy that's produced in Montana can be shipped um, generally to, to states that are nearby, Washington, Oregon, and some further. Uh, this is a similar graph to, to what we've seen earlier um, on, on a larger scale. So this is, this is the U.S. Um, about half of the U.S. production um, at one time came from coal. However, that's falling off. It's being replaced primarily through renewable sources and also natural gas. And natural gas, because it is a fairly inexpensive source, is becoming more uh, dependent upon for energy production. So the future of coal looks like it will be decreasing, and a lot of that has to do with the environment. So to talk about the future of coal specifically in Montana, there is one current, um, current uh, application for a new coal mine. It will be a surface coal mine along Otter Creek, also within the Powder River Basin, so not far from the current surface mines. Uh, if it does come on, it's in the environmental review process right now. If it, if it does come on, it will produce approximately 20 million tons over 20 years from just the first developed track, which is track two right here. Uh, so currently Montana's producing 40 million tons. This would increase Montana's production by 50%. However, there are a number of environmental concerns that need to be addressed before this will come on. Being a hydrogeologist, my world centers around the, the water effects, either the groundwater, the surface water, and the riparian area, because it is along a, a perennial stream. However, there are, are a number of other issues, ranging from socioeconomic to cultural 
to, to environmental concerns that, that extend beyond water. And I think what we've heard so far today, and I think that we'll hear about throughout the day, is that the future of coal is going to be very dependent upon being able to deal with the CO2 question and other environmental questions associated with coal. Montana is dealing with it um, in one way, and we'll hear more about this later, I believe. Through carbon sequestration, there's a current active research site at Keevan Dome. This is in the north central part of Montana. It's a naturally occurring carbonate dome with so a porous rock capped by a, a cap rock which is impervious to gas. It's a naturally occurring gas trap. It's been produced for natural gas now for, for several years and it's currently being produced for natural gas. It has a large amount of CO2 naturally present. So there is a current research effort underway to evaluate this structure and similar structures for uh, geologic sequestration of CO2. And so the current characterization of Keevan Dome will look at injecting 1 million tons of CO2. They have a lot of monitoring plates currently to see what happens to that CO2 um, and, and whether it escapes and what happens to it once it is underground. Other traps that are being explored, geologic traps, include basalt flows, which there are extensive throughout Washington and Oregon. Deep coal has been shown to be a, a good CO2 trap and also flooding of oil and gas reservoirs, which is currently ongoing in several of Montana's older oil and gas fields. However, they generally use CO2 that's not from a Montana source, and so they're bringing CO2 in from out of state. The future of Montana coal could probably um, be, be seen as more of a, of a circular, uh, more uniform set if the CO2 that's burned in Montana could be sequestered in Montana and could be used for CO2 flooding in Montana. Um, so I don't want to go into too much of this because I believe we'll be hearing about um, both the CO2 flooding and, and CO2 sequestration later in the day. So jumping to, mon to coal bed methane, this is one of our monitoring wells in southeastern Montana. You can see often our monitoring wells are the highest point out there. There's not, um, not a plethora of trees to be seen. But um, it, is, it is beautiful in its own way, and I do enjoy my work quite a bit. So this is, this is one of our wells, again, this is oops, um, one of those wells that blows gas naturally, so we do have to warn people that, um, not to open it up because it could be a, a hazard. Coal bed methane, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, methane occurs naturally in coal seams and in order to, to economically produce it, a well is drilled into the coal seam, is under reamed, and a water well is placed in the coal. The water is extracted to the surface in a central pipe. The methane, by lowering the hydrostatic pressure of the coal, by removing that water, the methane is allowed to naturally desorb from the coal. It's collected in an annular pipe. The methane is sent to a compressor station and then onto the grid. And the water is managed at the surface for disposal. And so a lot of my work involves looking at these management issues and the implications of that. So because each well needs to produce um, between 5 and 10 GPM on a continuous basis, this can have a pretty significant hydrologic effect in the area. So this is a picture of our monitoring network. Again, we're down here in southeastern Montana. Um, these colored dots represent coal bed methane wells in Wyoming. These dots, I'm, I'm sorry, it's probably difficult to see. The red and gray represent um, shut-in and active coal bed methane wells in Montana. The purple squares are where we're monitoring the groundwater. So we monitor over 200 wells um, around 15 springs and some streams in this area. Montana's uh, CBM picture is not what it used to be. Um, this is 1999 on this end. We go up to 2015 over here. The circles represent the number of wells per month that are producing either water or gas in Montana. Uh, so you can see 
that it peaks at around 700 wells in 2008. And since 2008 has fallen um, steadily, currently there are less than 100 producing full bed methane wells in Montana. The water, which is this solid black line, the production per month follows very closely the number of wells. And so when a new wells come on, generally there is a, a relative kick in the amount of water that's also produced has fallen off as well to match the, the fewer wells that are producing. The gas that was produced did not follow that as closely. So the, the newer plays, the, um, the old, they went into old known fields first where they knew they would get a lot of gas. These were the more marginal plays. And when gas became less economic to produce, it became um, very quickly in these marginal plays um, more beneficial to move out of there than to continue. A similar story in Wyoming, where Montana is currently at about 10% of the amount of production that we had in 2008. Wyoming is about half. So again, Wyoming peaked in 2008 as well. These are the number of producing wells, but at over 18,000 wells. And now they are at closer to 8,000 wells, so about half of what they were producing at one time. Uh, similar, similar story because similar economics are at play. Gas prices have fallen off dramatically. It's currently at about two to two and a half dollars per MCF. The break even point that you hear from the industry is usually closer to four. So they're at about half of what they need. A lot of the economics of coal bed methane comes from the costs associated with developing, um, with dealing with the water and the, the cost associated with that. A lot of the, the impact to the price of methane comes from shale gas, because shale gas is so prevalent now, and, and it's easier and cheaper to, to produce than coal bed methane. So the future of CBM. Currently, coal bed methane wells in Montana, their lifespan is less than 10 years, which is less than what was anticipated when the environmental impact statements were written, they were assumed to, to last over a decade, but they're on the order of six to eight years of life. So the methane in, in the coal in Montana, it's well known, is generated through microbial processes. There are coals throughout the US where the methane is created through temperature and pressure. However, these coals are low temperature and shallow. The methane here is generated through the digestive processes of the bugs that live in the coal. So there are a number of groups working on ways to improve the, um, to, to uh, get these bugs to work harder, to eat more, generate more. Um, and so, and this is just a, a chemical summary of how coal is broken down to the final byproduct of methane. One of those groups that we work with is out of MSU in the biofilm department. This is Elliot Barnhart. He was a, a student researcher of ours who went on to get his PhD in this um, in the, the years after he worked with us. So he created a way, this is his first prototype. Um, the ones he installs now are much shinier and prettier. But, um, but he put this together out of, out of what he could find. And it, worked, it worked really well for, for what he was trying to do which was to capture in situ um, microbial populations. And so he's gone on to identify genetically which microbial populations are present. And also um, their group is working on ways to stimulate these microbes in order to make more methane. And so this, if they are successful, could potentially be a very low impact way to increase the methane that's produced from already established infrastructure. Um, if you can in increase the methane, it would theoretically reduce the amount of water demand as well. They've had success, um, and this is just some of their really early time results. They've, um, I'm sure they're coming out with a couple of papers here in the very near future, but um, just as an example, um, the coal plus yeast extract resulted in a much more significant methane development. This is all at the lab scale, at the bench scale. They are ready to start moving into the field and do a much larger in situ um, study. 
And that's what I've got for you today.